but keeping one eye on the clock. I hope everyone won't mind if we now move on to uh, our next presentation, which is from Kari May and Zach Broad from the University of Pittsburgh. Kari is the Digital Archivist and Preservation Manager, uh, Pre Preservation Librarian, excuse me, and Zach is the University Archive and Records Manager. There we go, I get it right. And they both work at the University of Pittsburgh in the Library System Department. And they're gonna share with us their, their email workflow uh, which has been a, a common to all of the, the workflow webinars we've had this this uh, this week, but they've got a particular focus on legal concerns and security and ensuring authenticity. So, uh, guys, you've already loaded your slides and you're ready to go. So, um, please, uh, the digital floor is yours. Okay. Start my clock. All right. Um, well, I just dropped my notes. So of course I have to, as long as I do it right at the beginning, all the, all the screw ups are done. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I am Carrie May and I am here with Zach Broad and we are from the University of Pittsburgh Library System. And we are gonna present our preserving email for the university archives. Uh, this is really gonna be a, a basic walkthrough of how we have created our, I'm going to call it current and fledgling uh, workflow for uh, preserving, the preserving email and it's been based on a specific collection. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. So um, for a little bit of background, um, our adventure sort of begins when we were tasked with acquiring the records of our university's outgoing chancellor. Um, the chancellor here at the University of Pittsburgh is the chief executive of the university. And so they're involved in or informed of um, just about um, all of the most significant decisions at the university. Uh, the University Archives then is responsible for documenting the evolution and the decisions of the university. And so our collections are considered to be the official institutional records and therefore hold legal bearing. Uh, to protect privacy and other sensitive information, uh, records of the chancellor are closed for 25 years from the conclusion of the chancellor's term. And so these particular records that we're talking about would not open for research until about August of 2048. Uh, since the late 1960s, the Chancellor's Office has standardized their record keeping into four uh, main categories. Uh, something that they call mail log files are basically just their, their term for their filing system for incoming messages and attachments. And these can also include the responses from the Chancellor's Office as well. Uh, there are chronological files, which are basically just the outgoing correspondence of the Chancellor that are kept in chronological order. Uh, subject files that are curated about a topic or organization, things like that and then speeches and other public presentations. Um, the previous uh, chancellor served from 1995 to 2014. And um, so he kind of was like uh, right there when we were um, bridging that gap between paper and the electronic, but he was very much of that generation that was printed all. And so um, we got a lot of paper when he left uh, in 2014. Um, this new chancellor, though, uh, was much more comfortable with technology, and his staff was as well. And so uh, the records that we received when he stepped down are entirely digital. Uh, knowing this, um, I visited the chancellor's office within his first two years uh, to review how his office was maintaining and managing their digital records. And this allowed us to anticipate um, how we might receive the records when he stepped down, and we could start planning for that really early on. Uh, once the chancellor announced that he was uh, going to resign, uh, we began meeting with his staff um, to start planning and strategizing for the transfer, and that was in uh, July of 2022, and just laying out some expectations on both sides um, over the course of the year on how this transfer would, would happen. So what could we expect from this chancellor? Uh, each electronic system that they were using still mapped to the familiar paper filing scheme that we were already familiar with. So um, they used a system, a document management system called Perceptive Content, which uh, the contents corresponded to the mail log files. Um, they were using Microsoft OneDrive uh, as a collaboration space. And this included uh, what we would call the subject files and the speeches. And then the email is essentially the chronological files. Uh, we worked with the Chancellor's Office Executive Support Team Supervisor uh, to export the files from each system and then facilitate their transfer to a library server partition. And a little bit about me. Um, I'm the first digital preservation librarian at for the University of Pittsburgh, much less the University Library System. And I come from a background that was in records management. So this is sort of familiar. And I grew up, if you will, in a a uh, situation that had a format um, agnostic perspective. Basically, a record is a record. It doesn't matter what medium it comes in. And I say medium because if it's carved in a rock, we took it. Um, so 
basically my mind is that these may be digital, but they need to receive the exact same amount of diligence as they would be expected to as a piece of paper. Um, and that kind of thing is already planned out. So my idea was, okay, then if that's how I feel in this new situation, how do I work to make sure that I meet the needs of records management while ensuring that these assets are on a really good, effective and efficient path for digital preservation? The answer ends up being, we've got to collaborate because this is brand new and we've got to get these things to come together. So the collaboration began when I invited uh, Zach to a one-on-one -on -one meeting to discuss these things. And um, we basically sat down and we had a discussion about being format agnostic, defined that, made sure we were on the same page about it. Then we discussed uh, the special requirements of these particular assets. Then we finally got to the nitty gritty and said, okay, for our goals, what sort of level of processing are we both expecting? What kind of intensity of curation can be allowed with these? What steps are we going to use for, uh, excuse me, ensuring authenticity from the earliest point possible? And then finally, final storage. What's expected out of that considering the longevity that they're going to be stored? So there we are. We found our common, our common ground, but at the same time, we're still coming from different directions. So it was time for some independent research. We decided to take our own little routes for a bit, and Zach started looking at the digital processing framework, interested in that and seeing what that was all about, and I was going to refresh myself about email. Yeah, so we wanted to keep um, the collection processing as close to the familiar paper processing uh, process as possible. Um, the archivist could handle the arrangement and the description work just like they'd always done, and the digital preservation librarian can help ensure that we're addressing concerns like maintaining authenticity, any other issues that maybe we don't uh, think about uh, when we're dealing with uh, processing paper records. Um, during my search for some best practices, I came across the digital processing framework. Uh, this was developed in 2018 and is currently hosted by uh, Cornell University. Um, the framework, um, you know, when you look at it, seemed to address all of our needs. Um, it outlines um, just about every step in consideration from the beginning to the end for processing born digital collections, which I really appreciated as somebody new uh, coming to this. <laughs> Um, it also um, allows us to assign specific tasks to the digital preservation librarian or the processing archivist. Um, so nobody in this process feels like they need to know how to do everything. We can really just focus on the expertise of each individual who's um, playing a role here. Um, and then um, it also um, offers some transparency and helps us maintain the expectations of what each other's doing during this process. Uh, the framework also offers three different tiers of processing, depending on your interests, your time, your resources. So it's really flexible. So um, it, you could take a very high level approach, but then if there's something much more important that really needs to get down to the nuts and bolts of it, it allows you to do that as well. And the steps on the framework are not file type specific. And so it can be applied to all kinds of electronic records, including email. And that's what I was brushing up on was my email. Um, I have worked with an account in the past, but uh, because of the specifications in that situation, we couldn't even open up our PST. It was it was not okay to do the available methods. So I was like, I'm going to brush up on that just in case, but we need to look for something new. And I was very lucky. This is not a plug. They didn't ask me to do this, just so you know. Um, I literally <laughs> came in, uh, in to know about the novice to know how email preservation training from DPC and it was very, very helpful for our situation. Um, it provided these details that were things I wanted to know and refreshing details as well, alongside some uh, possible strategies. Um, and these things started reflecting so many things that Zach and I had talked about. I was shooting him emails with quotes and 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 links and all sorts of things. I was bombing his email saying, hey, look at this. This is confirming that we're talking about something that's that's possible. There are tools and things out there for to make this happen. We can make this a reality. So that was exciting. All right. So the reality that we were facing with this email. First of all, University of Pittsburgh uses Microsoft Office Suite. Therefore, Pitt um, email accounts are from Outlook. Because they are pit wide, not university, that means we're going to have to use uh, work with, excuse me, university IT, not just our ULS IT. We have a tiny little group um, that's wonderful, but we're going to have to work with the big, uh, the big boys, if you will. 
When we were doing this, we were thinking, let us not bring them any unnecessary migraines. Um, and when I looked through that uh, email preservation training, I saw some positive items there about using a PST if you have a way to get to it and, and utilize it. Um, and then um, working with Preservica the way that we do, they're also saying, well, we can actually do some things with, with PSTs. So that led to, if we're going to talk to university IT and ask them to pull these things, let's keep it simple. Let's ask them to pull it just as a PST and hand it to us that way. Um, then we spoke with Preservica about using their methods and started to like that and said, well, let's not go through all of these other extra possible programs to add on to it and change it around. Let's just maintain this PST and continue forward. The one headache we did ask from IT and the Office of the Chancellor, that's what that OTC stands for, um, is to provide us with checksums from the moment they pulled it until the end of our, our work with them, getting them into preservation so that we can check this authenticity from the first transfer to our server and beyond. So even though um, the collection is closed for 25 years, we wanted to get to work immediately, uh, one, so we could benefit from the institutional knowledge of the uh, Office of the Chancellor staff and, and ourselves and our familiarity in the, with the conversations that we've been having, um, and also ensure that the files are properly being preserved as quickly as possible. Uh, because the archives um, does maintain the official record for the university, um, occasionally the uh, new chancellor staff might need to access these files to inform their current decision making, or legal counsel might even uh, need access for litigation purposes, so it was important that we get everything um, together as quickly as possible. Uh, during processing, our digital processing archivist um, is reviewing every item for appraisal and privacy concerns, um, but we're trying to maintain uh, file names, limiting um, the rearrangement of the files as best we can, um, because things were pretty well organized. Um, we're also describing the collection at the folder level, just like it, if it was a paper collection. Uh, the usual series and subseries intellectual hierarchy that we already use in our uh, collection finding aids for paper collections is also being reflected in the uh, collection directory um, electronically. So far, uh, we have finished uh, processing the document management system files. Uh, that took us uh, maybe a little over a month to get through those and are currently wrapping up uh, the work on the OneDrive materials probably within the next few weeks here. Um, this system so far has worked pretty well for uh, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, PDFs, images, things like that that, that we are kind of used to. Uh, but now Carrie is tasked with uh, trying to adapt all of this into uh, addressing our email. Um, and I'm showing this now because um, when we're working with this audience, this is how uh, this is how Preservica is a, is able to actually present an email. Notice it's very much like an email and we think that this is a, the outcome that we want. So we have now this in mind and we move forward with, okay, if we want that to get to that final goal, that's the final, final moment, we have to always remember this ensuring authenticity idea. We did get those checksums from uh, IT and the office of the chancellor. So now we have to say, wait a minute, while we're working with these before we ingest, how are we going to compare them and ensure nothing is changing along the way? I had a chat with our Preservica rep, and uh, we discussed um, several different ways of doing this check from our point A to their point B, and they kept getting more complicated. And then there was an epiphany that she had on hand, a tiny little piece of Python script. And it would go right over the folder since we had those checksums, you know, in a, in a convenient uh, format there. And that's what we do. We now or well, this is what the idea was. We take that piece of script when a folder is finished and I'm given the green light by the cl collection archivist. I run it over. The compare comes out clean. I drop it uh, into our transfer aid, our application, which is WinSCP, which says no zero or one will move from point A to B. As soon as it gets to the bucket on the other end, it's ingested immediately. So the potential for things to go crazy is very, very small. Now we're talking about getting it ingested. With Preservica, the PST ingest is a special ingest. Uh, you have to set it up and put the uh, specifics in for for your for your situation and such. Uh, I was taught that we set it up. I did the um, the steps a couple of times and my tests, and they were wonderful and beautiful. And then I tried to put the chancellor's items in, and absolutely nothing would work. So here it was. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Preservica, help. What's going on? Talk to the reps. Did 
you remember that there is a, a volume limit that usually will make the system get a little crazy. Yes, but one of these that's failing is one quarter of that size. Can you give me any help? What am I doing wrong? Oh, look, 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 ah, you're not actually doing anything wrong. There are so many emails within that tiny, tiny package that it's making. It, it's basically making the, 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 if you will, the end just give up. I don't mean to insult them so badly, but it just <laughs> stops. <laughs> so this means their, their solution is you've got to have smaller PSTs. They're saying that led me to present to Zach this idea, which we then took to the Digital Preservation Working Group. And that was, we're going to use a two-fold process. We're going to ingest those original um, accounts as PSTs that we have not opened. There is a copy that has never been touched. We're going to ingest those and save them bitwise. That's going to be around forever and ever untouched so that if that legal situation comes in where we take on the second part and they they question and challenge that the emails they're looking at that have been through the second part are not authentic, we have that original, we can go get a new copy. That's as original as they're going to get by that time. Now, the second part is that second bullet point, get those smaller PSTs. Okay, to do this, to get that beautiful, exploded, beautiful email at the end, we're going to have to open the account somehow. The collection archivist is going to have to do some initial processing because we're going to have to make them smaller, right? Then we're going to have to have a way to pull out the, the export the new PSTs. Then they're going to have to be handed to me. I'm going to have to do that checksum compare. Hope that this still works the way it's supposed to. It shouldn't change anything to do the curation they're going to do. But we're going to run that. Everything gets clear. Push it on through just like everything else. And that is where our journey actually sits. We, as uh, Zach has told you, we have not quite gotten to the emails yet. So I'm still looking at um, a future of dealing with the smaller PSTs and still looking at the volume and complexity in that and, and having that to handle. Um, and while we've been on this wonderful path, Preservica has done an update and I'm glad that they did the update. I really am, but it's changed the steps that um, are necessary for the NGES. So I've gone through it. It's not really that difficult. It just has, it's a new, new set of habits. One more new set of habits. Isn't that just digital preservation? Uh, but, um, that's where I'm sitting on my journey. How about you, Zach? <laughs> yeah, um, for, for our part, um, the uh, process of going through and making the smaller PSDs actually kind of helps us a little bit uh, for processing because this allows us to, you know, open everything locally um, and we can do some appraisal work and we can eliminate some unnecessary messages because we got everything in these email accounts. So we can eliminate the spam. We can eliminate the junk mail that was probably clogging up that large PSD to begin with. And so we can do some of that work before it actually gets preserved um, like we wanted to in Preservica. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, just to make sure we hit that second bullet point, too, that was that was under yours, is that to do this, the um, when we presented it at the Digital Preservation Working Group, their suggestion was to use a virtual machine. So the collection archivist is does, they have set it up and will be working with the virtual machine and IT as, so far as getting those smaller exports out. And and we'll see what happens. Um, woo, look, we have a cliffhanger presentation. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and the last part there, I know it's in bold. Um, I don't know if that was rude or not, but I just wanted to put out there that there's probably people shaking their heads saying you're crazy to bother with all of this. Um, but we did have, we do have our reasons and these are the reasons. Uh, we keep pursuing that, that final beautiful end goal for ourselves because again, that view of an email looking like an email, it, it, it has that original feel as that says, but it will be the most comfortable for our audience and they're going to be the ones that are using it for the next 25 years. So I think that that presents really good customer service or researcher service. They're not customers and I'm in a research institution now. Um, and then also number two, we think, um, and I've been in this uh, game for a decade. And as I said before, the account I had, we couldn't open it up this way. We couldn't offer this look. So it was like, nope, just leave it until that can happen. Here we are with a possibility of that pres preserve an email as an email. If it's right there and it's possible, we're going to try and hang on and, and try to push for that, that look and, the, and that possibility to continue. So uh, we're being stubborn there. And then finally, we have a tool that says it can do it. I've seen it work. It will happen someday. So with that in mind, we're just going to keep pushing until it does work. Um, we and, and I say we have a tool, and that's even more important. As I said, we don't have to go outside of things. We don't have to add on this application and then run it through this and then change it back. It's all right there. So 
we're just trying to take the simplest route. And that was a whole lot. And I know we kind of, I kind of flew through my bits, but I want to say thank you very much for your time and attention and uh, appreciate it. Anything, Zach? No, thanks everybody. Okay. Oh, that, that was terrific, guys. Thank you very much. And as you say, leaving us on a cliffhanger there, you'll have to have to come back in, <laughs> in however long it takes, a year or two or whatever for, for part two, you know, they're, they're shedding a little more light. Um, again, some questions have been coming in whilst you've been talking. And um, I think, uh, actually, we should possibly should start with the most the, the latest one, which is coming from Andre, who was uh, asked to speak on the very first day. He was also looking at email archiving, and um, he's just saying, could you say a little bit more about what the size and number of messages are beyond which there are problems at ingest? So, uh, I guess how big the PST files are, or, or that create you a problem. Um. So far, we know about the volume <laughs> uh, because we have not uh, we haven't opened any of those accounts yet, so we can't really speak to the number yet. We didn't want to touch anything. We're doing as little touching as possible before um, the collection archivist gets to things. But as far as the size, um, Preservica, and it's Preservica that we're working with, so it's their thing. I don't know about other. I haven't. We haven't gone any other route, but theirs because we we are working with them. But uh, theirs is around four. Four gig, I believe it is. Four gig, yeah. Okay. And and it can it can give it can bob and weave um, depending on the number. Um, it's just it's it's literally because of the way the the system works and the specificities that it's looking for. There, there's a moment when there's a few too many folders or there's a few too many extra things to keep track of, so it it gets a little a little flaky. Okay, and I'm sorry, maybe I missed this, but did you? Did you choose Preservica in relation to this particular project or had, it's because it was already there in the institution and so you were sort of obliged to keep using it because Patricia has just raised the question, what will happen if you have to change to a different uh, digital preservation solution provider? Um, At this point, um, with the other, okay, I'm the very first digital preservationist for the university. Okay. It's uh, when we went looking, um, Preservica was the best fit for our needs for the to, to begin the program. Um, and we are uh, continuing with it. Um, be, we had a I don't want to skip subjects, but before this, our, our, we ran into getting a collection that was just jam packed with videos. Um, and so it, it was very, very heavy lifting. And there was there was actually. It, it remained the best idea. So we're, we, we've got those types of thoughts and, and with text files and photographic files about, you know, dealing with those, the email um, and this particular look. Good question about the future. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping that this can, you know, our, our work with Preservica can go on for, you know, until we feel we've got an idea of what we might do or, you know, another way that might be satisfactory. But at this point in time, again, we're just pushing for this, this type of a, of, a, of a look and feel and idea of, you know, let's keep pushing to get emails preserved as emails kind of a feeling. I know that's a very vague and probably not helpful answer, and I'm sorry, but that's just kind of where we are. Well, okay. I'll add to that. I'll add to that, too. I think, you know, part of the collaboration and, and our talks, um, you know, we realized early that as we're making decisions, we want to make the decision that will put us in the best position down the road if something better comes along or if we need to move somewhere. The PST was retaining um, the most information that could then kind of come along with us. If we need to pivot later on, it'll still be there and then we could adjust accordingly. Thank you. So, so yeah. in fact, that touches on a question from Matthias, doesn't it? Because he was saying, we well, says, is it? But I'm guessing, you, do you consider that the PST file then, you know, open and sustainable format for, for long-term preservation or I mean I, I guess you do because you're, you're keeping it uh what's the thinking behind that is it just that there are lots of PSDs in the world so there will always be a solution out there or, or is it something something else going on well how about if we see that um Microsoft is going to get ugly about uh, using the PST, we will definitely look at migrating it or you know transforming it to what would be a better idea. At this point in time, uh, working with it and especially with the tool that we have, 
it's reasonable. It is a reasonable okay. idea to let it sit. And um, I don't know. I mean, even with, uh, with uh, emulation is becoming even more popular again. It, it goes back and forth and there's more talk about emulation. So even maybe if it does get ugly to work with a PST, that there may be an emulator by the time that happens even. So, yeah, you know, it, it that's kind of a wait and see. It's very hard, um, or at least for me, I don't, I do my best to, as Zach said, make the decision that's best right now with the look that I feel I have. And I do in my head say forever, you know, 75 years minimum, I'll be dead and gone anyway. But, you know, at the same time, <laughs> try to leave something that somebody can handle. But at the same time, trying to look that far into the future with technology as slippery as it is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> try to look for different paths, the, the just in case methods. But, you know, for us right now, this is the best decision. Because Dan, I, he was first in with the questions, actually, I, I should be honest, and this touches on, on what we've just been saying there, because he says, um, have you run in, into any issues with Outlook uh, in Office 365 no longer being able or to, to export PSDs? Or, that's what he's been told by his IT folks, so maybe oh, really? Zach and other folk no different, you know. Pit IT got him out because we are on 365. And okay. yeah, they got it out. I don't know. I don't know how they did it, though, because their, their office is not our piece and and our ULS IT did not work with them. They sent it to us from the separate office. So sorry. I don't know. Uh, there you go, Dan. You'll have to find out what their secret source <laughs> is for, for, for getting the stuff out. And and, and I, I guess I had another slight question. You, you talked about, um, I wasn't quite clear in the process where the, the checksums are created on these PST files. Is it done in the office of the chancellor? Yes. by staff there and did you have to train them is it was that easy did they get what they were doing or is it I done by the it folk moving files around and they do it or, or what you know it's probably the way that i said it the office of the chancellor has an individual that works with pit it they're very okay are they the same is that person actually in pit it zach i think technically but his job is he is specifically there to support the office of the chancellor that is all he okay. does yeah. Okay. So it's a little trippy. Sorry about that. Of, of, of how to explain that, but 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 that individual was aware of of, of getting checksums and how to do that, and so they did that uh, all in their in their work there. Okay. Does that make more sense? <laughs> yeah. No. No. It, it makes okay. sense. I just thought sort of. Um, yeah. It was. It was good that you could get them to do that before yeah. the files came to you. I guess because that gives you so much more confidence in the authenticity of what you're getting and holding. Um, Okay, I think I'm going to draw it to a close there because we've been been chatting for about four or five minutes, and I want to give the next speaker. But can I thank you both again for for your presentation? And and I say we're we're waiting with bated breath to see how things turn out. <laughs> um, there may be a couple of questions in the in the chat that that I've missed, or a couple of comments. So if you are able to pick those up as we go along, that'd be fantastic.